just start out with an OH, OH. I so miss doing that live on site with all of you. And I hope you and your families are well. So last week's skills building, I just want to emphasize some key concepts. Move more, sit less, identify your barriers and how to overcome them. Plan your day, focus on the benefits of physical activity. Remember, if you shorten your meetings just by five or 10 minutes, you can use that recovery time to move, take a walk, do some jumping jacks, and then keep setting personal SMART goals to be more active. For those of you who don't know, I am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And throughout my career, I really have managed so many people with depression and anxiety. So it's winter in Columbus, Ohio, and it is normal to experience the blues and seasonal affective disorder. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today and how to prevent major depression from occurring in our lives. So the blues are defined as feeling sad or down, but the feelings pass in a few days, even a week. But the key fact here is these feelings of sadness do not interfere with your functioning, your concentration, or your judgment. We're going to be talking about depression. It's a serious illness, but very common. As a result of the pandemic, about one out of three adults in the United States are struggling with clinical depression or anxiety. Clinical depression, unlike the blues, does start to interfere with your functioning. So because in Columbus, during the winter, we get a little, a lot of rather cloud coverage, it's really common to see an onset of seasonal affective disorder during the winter months. The cause of the SAD is possible disruptions in our circadian rhythms due to the prolonged darkness, as well as alterations in serotonin, that chemical in the brain, that when we don't have enough of it, we tend to experience depression or anxiety, as well as melatonin, because we're not outside getting sun. This type of depression typically lifts during the spring and the summer. SAD can be treated very effectively for some with light therapy. You can get a light therapy box and expose yourself to that light 
30 minutes a day. There's some good evidence to support that helps. But about half of the people with seasonal affective disorder do not get better with light therapy alone. And that's when, if you're not getting better with light therapy, antidepressant medication and psychotherapy may be indicated. So we diagnose mental health disorders with the DSM-5. These are the common disorders that fall under the depressive disorder category. Major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder are the two most common out of this group. And these are the two that I'm going to be talking about today. So the common feature of depressive disorders is the presence of sad, empty, or irritable mood, which is accompanied with somatic, that's physical changes, as well as cognitive changes. But the key here is that the person is experiencing interference with their functioning. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the world, costing the United States economy $210 billion annually. The cost of mental health disorders in 2030 is projected to be greater than diabetes and cancer combined. The other thing we have to remember, depression is the major predictor of suicide and suicide is the second leading cause of death in 10 to 34 year olds. So again, depression is a really serious but treatable condition. The important piece of advice, if you're experiencing symptoms of depression that are interfering with your functioning, You've got to go get help. COVID, as we know, is triggering even more mental health problems as well as unhealthy lifestyle behaviors. So if you're experiencing these symptoms, please, you're not alone. Please recognize them and seek help. It's really a strength to be able to recognize you do need help and get treatment. This is the point where you've really got to get help. Again, when these symptoms are interfering with your concentration, your judgment, your functioning, we have a fabulous employee assistance program. Please don't hesitate to reach out. If you're a graduate student, please reach out to our student counseling and consultative center. So all of you have seen the Cope with COVID acronym that I have established to really remind us what we can do best to continue to cope. 
Controlling the things we can, not the things we can't. Opening up, sharing our feelings, practicing daily stress reduction, including physical activity. When we start to worry or to feel guilty, bring ourselves back to the present moment because worry or guilt are wasted energy. Most of what we worry about never comes to fruition. Count your blessings daily with gratitude. Overturn those negative thoughts that you have to positive. Volunteer to help others and identify helpful supports and resources. So I wanna talk now about the epidemiology of depression. It typically has affected one in four adults, but we are seeing increased prevalence during the COVID pandemic. There's a higher incidence in females and in minority populations. Detection though, sadly, is low, less than 20% of cases. Reoccurrence rate though, once you experience the first episode of major depression, about 60 to 70% of people will have a reoccurrence, especially if it's not treated well with evidence-based treatment the first time. Many times people who suffer with depression attempt to regulate those feelings with alcohol or substances. So again, it's super important to treat it effectively with evidence-based strategies so it doesn't result in an alcohol or other substance use problem. We also have to remember 40 to 70% of people who suffer with depression also have anxiety or a second mental health problem. The good news, if it's depression and anxiety together, the at best evidence-based first line treatment for both of those is cognitive behavior therapy or skills building. If you don't seek treatment, when you have an episode of depression, it typically lasts seven to nine months. But again, that's very dangerous not to get treatment because depression is a leading predictor of suicide. So the most common ways that depression presents sadness, withdrawn, loss of interest in things you used to enjoy. But I really wanna emphasize hopelessness as a piece of depression is the number one predictor of suicide. Oftentimes when people get depressed, they get really irritable and anxious and angry. Anger bursts where you maybe flip off on your child, your partner, Often people don't think of this could be depression, but I really want you to understand anger and irritability are frequent signs of underlying depression and or anxiety. 
many adults, just like children, do get somatic symptoms as they present with depression, recurrent headaches, fatigue, abdominal pain, a decrease or increase in sleep. A lot of people who get depressed eat emotionally. That's common too with anxiety. And drug and alcohol use is common as people hope to just regulate those symptoms. But alcohol itself is a depressant and can really make symptoms worse. So there's a valid and reliable screen called the PHQ-2. Over the past two weeks, have you ever felt down, depressed, or hopeless? Or have you felt little interest or pleasure in doing things? And as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, it is so imperative when we're ruling out depression to rule out thoughts of suicide. Has the person thought about killing themselves? Do they have a plan? Do they have access to a means? We have a check and improve your stress and well-being tool at this website. I'd encourage you all to go to this website to check your stress and well-being. We have embedded in there valid and reliable tools to screen for depression and anxiety. And the program will score the tools and then tell you where you fall. Maybe are you mildly depressed versus moderately versus severely depressed? So when we evaluate somebody for major depressive disorder, the criteria includes five or more of the following symptoms during the same two week period. And this represents a change from previous functioning. At least one of the symptoms is either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So again, five of these symptoms you're seeing on the slide. But what's super important is that the symptoms do interfere with functioning. Persistent depressive disorder is a lower level form of depression that's more prolonged. So it's when a person has a depressed mood for most of the day, for more days than not, as indicated by either them saying, yes, they're struggling with these things, or observation for at least two years. And it is causing distress or impairment of functioning. For children and teens, it's for one year. So to make this diagnosis, we look at the person and are they experiencing two or more of the following? Poor appetite or overeating, sleeping too little or much, fatigue or low energy, low self-esteem, poor concentration, and feelings of hopelessness. Well, there are a lot of causes of depression. 
One cause, though, that's very prevalent is the depressogenic cognition. That's a negative pattern of thinking. As we talked about in the lecture I did on cognitive behavioral skills building, negative patterns of thinking are usually so automatic by the time that we're an adult that we have to conscientiously catch ourselves when we're stressed, anxious, or depressed and say, what was just going through my mind? And is it true? Catching the negative thoughts, turning them around to feel better. These are the common health conditions and medications that can mimic depressive disorders. So if you're experiencing depression, it's important to see your primary care provider. It's important to rule out medical conditions like anemia, hypothyroidism, and then certain medications, as you see on this slide, can cause depression too. So a full evaluation is really needed to rule out any physical cause. Management of depression includes psychoeducation, talking to people about what are the normal symptoms of depression, how long they last, cognitive behavioral therapy or skills building. That's the first line evidence-based treatment for mild to moderate depression. Use of coping strategies that have worked before. Reinforcing everybody at some time in their lives needs a little help to cope and not forget to take good self-care. If we're not sleeping well, if we're not exercising and eating healthy, that all puts us at risk for anxiety and depression. Medications typically are reserved for severe depression. SSRIs like Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa are the drugs of choice. And I really want to emphasize, it usually takes four to six weeks to start to feel an effect from an antidepressant. A lot of people give up on them working in the first few weeks if they don't experience a change in their symptoms. But please know, four to six weeks is it takes to see an effect for most people. These should be used for six to nine months if you're put on one and never stopped suddenly. But I want to go back to cognitive behavior skills building, because if you can learn some of the skills that we teach in CBT, you can reverse negative patterns of thinking that then cause us to feel depressed or anxious, because how we think directly impacts how we feel and how we behave. So we teach people the ABCs in CBT. Monitor for activating events. Those are things that normally cause you to feel depressed or stressed. When you feel stressed or depressed, you need to stop and say to yourself right away, what was just going through my mind? What was I thinking? And then ask yourself, 
is it true? Is this thinking really helping me? And do I have the evidence to back it up? Because the far majority of times, the answer is going to be no. So the key is stop the negative thought, turn it around so we feel better. Well, we've done a lot of research on this seven session mind strong cognitive behavioral skills building program. We are now offering that to faculty and staff as well as students. Dr. Jackie Hoying is the program director. And even if you aren't depressed or stressed, going through this program to learn these skills will so help from a preventive standpoint. Well, another way we can turn negative thinking around to positive is getting up every day picking a self-affirmation statement and saying it 10 times in the morning and 10 times at night before we go to sleep. Because it really does reprogram the brain to think more positively. If all of us could get up every morning and do what this little girl does, we'd have a lot less depression and anxiety. Now my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my moms. I like my sisters. I like my dad. Everybody try it. It works. The other way we can program our brains positively is to get up every morning and just take a few minutes to read in a positive thinking book and read again before you go to sleep at night. Don't give up changing negative to positive thinking. If you tend to be a negative thinker, takes 30 to 60 days of consistent practice. We have so many terrific resources at Ohio State to help. Please engage with what we have. And I'm gonna finish my talk by just giving you a few more tips about how to prevent and beat the blues. Even if you don't feel like this, feel like exercising, do it anyway. It will so help your mood. That's called behavioral activation in cognitive behavior therapy. Manage your energy, build in recovery breaks during the day, sit less, stand more. Help yourself stay mindful in the present moment. Sleep is so critical, at least seven hours a night. Balancing work and personal life, taking the time, even if you feel you don't have the time, to engage in something that you enjoy during the week. Please also get your vitamin D level checked. In Columbus, where we experience a lot of cloud coverage during the winter, vitamin D commonly drops low. And research has shown that it often can precipitate some depression. Laugh more often. Take your dose of vitamin G every day. When you wake up in the morning, just 
think about one or two people or things that you're grateful for every single day. Nick Bacusek, who was born without arms or legs, he always says, I can be angry or I can be thankful that I've got a purpose. I chose gratitude. Gratitude is so powerful. If you can practice that every day, you'll feel so much better. Lastly, know your limits. Don't feel guilty about saying no. Stay aligned with your dreams and your passions and by all means, get help. If your symptoms persist more than two weeks and interfere with your functioning. So this is the CBT skills building exercise. I would like you to practice every single day until we get back together on January 13th. So join us on January 13th for Beating the Blues by Unplugging. Thanks, everybody. I wish you and your families a blessed and healthy holiday season. All right. Thank you, Bern. We will do a couple of questions. I know we're running a little over here, so um, we'll just do a couple really quick. Okay. One person asks, what resources are available to help explain these conditions to your partner if they are not able to understand why you need help to explain why you can't just stop feeling bad or angry or worried? Uh, CBT is very difficult in the midst of adversity with your partner about your mental health. Yeah, there are some outstanding resources that you can share with your partner at the National Institute for Mental Health. Uh, very written in easy, explainable terms. So just Google the National Institute of Mental Health and Depression, and you'll get to those fantastic resources. Great. One person asks, uh, will MindStrong be available for staff dependents? I think we should. Uh, talk about opening it up to staff dependents. So thank you for bringing that up. I'll take that back to our team. And the last question we have here is ADHD medication a cause for depression? Not ADHD medication alone, but what I do want to say is many people who have ADHD also suffer with comorbid depression and anxiety. So you just want to be in tune again. About 60 to 70 percent of people do suffer from more than one mental health condition and depression and anxiety frequently go along with the primary condition. But again, it's treatable. We have such great evidence-based treatment. The key is recognizing it and getting the help. Let's destigmatize mental health problems and let's support people to get the help that they need. There is hope for sure.